I'm Alexander Paul Smith, and this is my life in books. Alexander McCool Smith, the man behind the number one ladies detective agency series of novels, is one of those people who turns out to be exactly as you would imagine. And I mean this in the best possible way. He arrived for this interview at the Jaipur Literature Festival in a linen suit and straw hat, introduced himself by his nickname Sandy, and then proceeded to be extraordinarily good company. Meandering from stories about his childhood in Bulawayo to self-deprecating anecdotes about his own writing, with a bit of recited poetry thrown in for good measure, of course. It was a joy, and I believe the interview my mother is most jealous of me for having done. For a man who has sold a gazillion books, he seemed completely unfazed at being asked to record this podcast wedged into a corridor above what must surely be the noisiest literature festival in the world. But look, before we get to any of that, just a very quick shout out to say, please do subscribe to the Books of My Life podcast. We'd love to have you with us every week. And you must, must send us your own choices as well. We've got an email address books of my life at the national.ae and we want to hear from you. Back to Alexander McCall Smith. Forgive the crashing and the clattering and enjoy hearing from one of our most cherished authors about the books that changed his life. Uh, well look, it's uh, <laughs> such a joy to say that I'm here with the Brilliant novelist Alexander McCall Smith, uh, the man behind some of our favourite literary creations, including the number one ladies detective agency and, of course, 44 Scotland Street. Uh, I'm absolutely sure I won't be alone when I say that your books fill almost every available space in my parents' house, all of them battered from multiple readings. I actually tried to count, Alexander, how many books you've published and got as far as, gosh, uh, 58 novels, one short story collection... And 35 children's books. Am I about right? <laughs> Something like that. I, 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 I've stopped counting. I really have stopped counting. So uh, your, your count is, is probably better than mine. <laughs> OK. Uh, well, anyway, look, thank you so much for joining us uh, for Books of My Life, a podcast from The National, where I get to ask a different guest each week about all things books. Uh, let's get straight to it. Alexander McCall-Smith, how on earth do you find time to do anything, let alone read, when you're writing as much as you are? Well, I think that uh, the important thing about uh, being a writer is to have a regime and to have a timetable. Mm. So you, you create the uh, particular time for your writing and then you, then you can get round to having some time for reading. Uh, but of course, um, as with any job, in a, in, in a sense, you have to fight for the, the, the reading time. Most people these days really have to struggle to find uh, enough time to read because of the requirements of modern life. Modern life seems to uh, impinge on, uh, on one's time time so much. So, so, so when do you read actually? Well I, I tend to read, uh, before I go to bed I read and that of course becomes increasingly unsatisfactory <laughs> in that you read about two sentences or three sentences and then off you go to sleep. So that's, uh, that is a bit of uh, a difficulty. I read, sometimes if I wake up in the middle of the night, as I often do, uh, I tend to write in the early hours of the morning, so I often get up at four. And if I'm, if I'm awake at, say, three in the morning, I'll, I'll, I'll get in half an hour's reading then. So that's quite a good time. There are no other disturbances. And then during the day, uh, when one's travelling, of course, that's a good time to read. If you're on, on an aeroplane or a train, uh, you, can, you can read then. Uh, but it is, it is a battle to find the reading time that one really, really yeah. needs. When one thinks of, of, say, Victorian times where people had these long afternoons and they could read and, and they could... That's why they managed to read those Victorian novels, yeah, 800 pages. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I must ask, not, not because you say that you're falling asleep after two pages, but I must ask, what are you, what are you actually reading at the moment? What's on the bedside table? Uh, well, I, I usually have uh, quite a number of, of, of books uh, on the uh, bedside uh, table. Uh, I'm at the moment uh, going through George Eliot, uh, and so I'm uh, enjoying um, uh, Middlemarch, uh, which I started many years ago and never finished. And now I'm enjoying that uh, greatly. And that, of course, is so full of, of detailed and interesting observations and all sorts of things that it's the sort of book that you can get a couple of pages at a time and, and still get great satisfaction mm. from that. And then I, I, I have other books. I read quite a lot of 
um, non-fiction. Mm. Uh, so I've just picked up a, a, a book which I've, I've just started here on, on Hinduism, which is which is proving to be rather rather interesting. Uh, I went through a spell recently reading a lot of books about Homer's Odyssey in particular and Homer in general. Uh, all sorts of things, pretty eclectic. Gosh, so, so, so what makes you um, go back to George Eliot at, at this stage of life? Well, I think that that actually is, is one of the great uh, consolations, uh, uh, the, the classic, classic novels. Mm. Uh, it's, it's rather like a, a, having a, a meal where there are different courses, and some courses are more substantial than the other courses. So uh, somebody like George uh, Eliot isn't hors d'oeuvre, uh, really. Uh, George Eliot is, is, is the main course, and it's the substantial, serious nature of of the classics that I, I rather like. It's it's a change of a change of pace. Mm. There's more there's more room, there's more air in those novels than there might be in, say, a modern novel which tends to be more business like and more to the point. So, so do you quite like to um, to have something quite heavy on the go for want of a better word and then and then something light because I know I sort of I like to read, you know, a classic for want of a better word and, and then and then read a sort of a slightly easier thriller. Is, is, that, is, that, is that the way that you like to go about it? Yes, I, I think uh, I, th- I think that's right. I think it's it's it really it's the analogy is a very diet. Mm. Uh, one takes the same approach at the table, uh, so I, I think that that that, 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 that well. works well. Yeah. Um, let's go back a little bit. Um, it's a it's a big question, obviously, but can you um, can you remember the first book that had a sort of a really profound effect on your life? Well, I certainly remember uh, several books I had as a as a very very small child. Mm. Uh, they're rather interesting in that I uh, whether they had a great effect on my life is another matter. They may, I suppose, subliminally uh, have that sort of effect under the radar. But uh, the first book that I remember cherishing was a funny little uh, blue book uh, with a slightly plasticky, uh, sort of almost washable cover, uh, which was the, the boy's book of merchant shipping. And it, was, it consisted of uh, a series of, of um, uh, little articles on prominent merchant ships uh, with their design, pictures of them and their tonnage and their routes and not much else (laughs) and I thought this was absolutely wonderful book, I thought it was the most marvellous book ever and I slept with that under my pillow I wish I could find the boys book of merchant shipping again and then I had a, another uh, Ladybird book. Remember the Ladybird books, which were wonderful. I think they're still, go, still going strong. And yeah, I sorry to interrupt. I should just say that we're at the uh, Jaipur Literature Festival, so if you can hear anything going on in the background, it's because we're sat in the balcony in the, uh, in the Diggy Palace at the moment. Um, but anyway, Alexander, I'm sorry I interrupted you. All sorts of interesting noises are, are going on in the background. Yeah. But uh, yes, this Ladybird book was called Ginger's Adventures. Right. And it was written in doggerel verse. And it was all about a dog called Ginger who had a very satisfactory life on the farm where he lived with a boy called Tommy. And then he was taken off to London to live with a girl. And that, of course, changed his life considerably. He was put on silken cushions and he didn't like London at all. And he ran away and went back to the country right. and went back to live with the boy and was very happy. Now, that sort of thing couldn't be published today. <laughs> I'm sure not. Um, and and, and are, you, um, are you from a family of, of, of big readers? Yes, uh, we, we, we always read. One of the, the books that I had, collections of books that I had, uh, when I was young, I think I got this when I was about eight or nine, mm. and I must say I probably owe a great deal to that particular um, set of uh, books. It was Arthur Mead's Children's Encyclopedia, uh, which had about 20 volumes, and I had that at that age, and I absolutely adored that. I read and reread that, and it was the most uh, ill-organized encyclopedia you could hope to hope to find because the articles followed one another in no particular order so you had an article about steam trains and then was an article about merchant ships again mm. and then you'd get on to poetry and they had a lot of poetry in it and I read the, 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 the poetry and then you'd suddenly find yourself reading an article on the construction of the pyramids <laughs> which, which when you were eight is terribly interesting and uh, probably interests some people today as well but nonetheless that was very influential I read an awful lot of poetry and I think I probably had uh, a bit of feeling, my feeling for, insofar as I've got that, mm. for language w- would have been instilled in this, this uh, exposure to poetry. And then going to school and learning poetry by heart, mm. which I thought uh, at that stage was a bit of a chore, but my goodness me, I think that's a good thing to do, having to learn 15 lines of poetry a day. Yeah. And so you, you learn, for example, Longfellow's um, 
uh, wonderful Hiawatha, which of course has this insistent uh, rhythm behind it, uh, all about Hiawatha and many ha ha. And I still remember. I was going to say, do you still remember these, oh, yes. these lines? Oh yes, and the great seas, shining water. Oh yes, wonderful, Incredible. wonderful stuff. That's great stuff. Um, and, and tell me, where, where, where were you in the world at this time? Because you, you, you grew up in what was Rhodesia and the yeah. Zimbabwe, is that That's right? right yes. um, and and, and did, did, did your reading habits uh, change depending on where you were in the world at any given time? Not really. I suppose I, I spent my childhood in the middle of, middle of Africa there, and so I was probably exposed to some influences, literary influences, that I might not otherwise have had. So I was at a very early age, I was given a copy of Jock of the Bushveld, right. uh, which of course was... Uh, uh, the, the story about this uh, this very brave dog. Uh, nowadays, if you try to read the original, it's it's written in an extraordinarily complicated way, and I, I'm surprised any child managed to read his way through through that. Uh, I also uh, I, I was exposed to a certain amount of Kipling at that age, uh, at that age for obvious reasons, and so I very much loved. Uh, the story of Ricky Tiki Tavi, of course, uh, which is which is a very exciting exciting story, and I think uh, at a young age I, I could more or less recite it. I'd read it so many times, and that struck me as being very very exciting uh, yeah, story indeed. Um, so I must ask you, um, <coughs> what, uh, what what's the book that you would uh, that you'd love to give to your younger self if you had the chance now? Is it, is it something you've read in later life that you think, God, I wish I'd uh, I wish I'd been aware of that when I was growing up? Yes. Uh, yes, I think that I, I probably would uh, would have liked to would like to be able to give to myself at that age uh, a book that is one of my absolute favourite books still to this day, and that's W. H. Auden's collected shorter poems. Oh, I see. Okay. I'm a very great fan of, of Auden. Auden is my main literary enthusiasm. I've written a book about Auden's work, mm. and I think Auden was the most marvellous, um, humane uh, voice. Uh, a most wonderful uh, poet who used um, every sort of meter known to English uh, mm-hmm. poetry and uh, also covered so many different subjects. I mean, he wrote a poem about limestone and the charms of limestone and then a poem, a poem about um, uh, Yeats or a poem mm-hmm. about, uh, uh, about love, uh, all of these subjects of, of which... Um, is rather broader than I suppose most poets range um, I would love to be able to give to my <clears throat> say 16 year old self mm. uh, Auden's poem uh, on Sigmund Freud on the on the on the uh, death of uh, Sigmund Freud he wrote this in memoriam of Sigmund Freud uh, in 1939 uh, when um, uh, he was in uh, Auden was in America and it's a lovely um, lovely mm. poem uh, which it, has lines which uh, really uh, I think are so liberating and of course that's something one would want to say to the 16 year old self don't worry, don't be so anxious, don't, don't be concerned about what other people are thinking about you, all of the, the dreadful uh, problems of, of, of te- the teenage years and if you could say, well, look, just relax um, Do you have any of these lines committed to memory? Or oh not? yes Perhaps well, you could I mean, give us a couple well, Auden talks about, <clears throat> in that poem, he talks about how um, when uh, you uh, examine your past and examine yourself through uh, psycho, psychoanalytical um, therapy, for example, uh, you uh, become aware, uh, as he says, um, of by whom you have been judged. And that's quite a powerful line. And then he says, as a result of that, you may be able to approach the future as a friend mm. without a wardrobe of excuses, without a set mask of rectitude. Mm. I see. That's that. a lovely idea, yeah. able to approach the future as, as a friend. Uh, so um, I think there are so many lines in Auden which, which stick in my mind and which make me feel better and make me feel less anxious about the world or more accepting of the world mm. or just reconciled to, to the world, and that I think was Auden's great, great gift. I, I noticed that poetry comes up time and again, which I perhaps mm. didn't, didn't, didn't expect. Do you, do you, do you, do you write a lot of poetry yourself? Yes, I do. I do quite a lot. I, I, I usually put poems in my Scotland Street books at the end. I, one of the characters, Angus Lordy, mm. writes a poem. In fact, I write it for Angus, and so there's a poem published in, in that. And I, I, I write, um, I write a lot for composers. Uh, uh, in recent years, I've been writing uh, poems which composers have set to music, song cycles, 
Uh, I've written operatic uh, libretti. Uh, I've written recently a, a couple of operettas, which obviously in perfect form, uh, which I've taken uh, from uh, one of uh, Walter Scott's uh, um, books, the um, uh, Guy Mannering. Uh, it's an op- operetta based on that. Um, so I do, I do a lot of uh, a lot of poetry, and I've recently published uh, an anthology of, of Scottish poetry, um, uh, which was called The Gathering, mm. and that was published last year. And um, I very much enjoyed doing that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, give us, I mean, you're obviously at literary festivals all the time, and in and around the, the literary world. Can you can you give our listeners? Um, a couple of exciting young authors that you've that you've come across recently that you'd like to recommend. Well, that's a very awkward question for me <laughs> because one of the difficulties uh, that I mentioned earlier on about finding time enough time to read yeah. is that actually there are all these wonderful new authors emerging, mm. and I realise that I should be reading their works and I just don't have the time to do that. So this is a matter of great embarrassment, grave embarrassment to me, particularly when one's at literary festivals and you meet all these tremendously uh, talented uh, emerging authors and uh, you, you, you haven't read their books. And so really you, you have to come clean and you say to them, uh, you can say I haven't read your book, but you try to avoid saying that because that's something that no author likes to hear. Authors like to hear the <laughs> saying, I've just read your book. And you say, I haven't read your book. You can say, I'm looking forward to reading your book. Yeah. I, I, you... I hope these comments aren't terribly loaded, Alexander. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> or I've uh, <laughs> certainly read lots and lots of your, lots of your novels. <laughs> you put it very tactfully. You can say, I'm looking forward to reading your books. Or you can say, I've heard a lot of people are reading your books. Yeah. They like that. Uh, and even if they haven't written a book yet, you can say, a lot of people are waiting to read your book. Okay. <laughs> when you write it. Yes, exactly. Um, so I hope it's not too much of an interesting question, um, but what was the last book that you read that, uh, that moved you to tears? Can you remember? I would have difficulty with that. I have, I have been moved to tears by books. I do remember being moved to tears when I was... 15 or 16, reading Robert Burns' A Man's A Man for All That. Okay, yeah. And I actually cried on reading that. Why, why, why was that? Well, it's just such a wonderful statement of uh, human um, equality, uh, of, of recognition of, of essential humanity of others. I, was just, I found it very, very moving, and I, I re- really burst into, into tears. I'm sure that I have cried since then. <laughs> Over, over, over books. Yeah. Um, but it's difficult to remember. Okay. Um, well, I'm amazed that you're reading uh, Robert Burns at 15, 16. Oh yes, yeah. yes, yes. That's interesting. And have you been moved to tears in that? Um, well, I, do you know what? the last one that uh, that really got me? And I don't know if this is embarrassing or not. I hope not. Is the uh, the curious instance, the dog in the night time? Have you read that? I haven't. No. no yeah. No. It's, um... no. No. Sorry, I have read that. I have read that. No, I did read that. And, and yes. how did you find it? Uh, well, I found that very interesting. I mean, yeah. I, I found the voice there yeah. extraordinarily interesting. But I didn't. I didn't. No, it didn't move me to tears. Interesting. Uh, but, it's um, um, yeah. It's, it's not a hugely common occurrence, but I yeah. I, I do remember that having a really profound effect on me, and um, yeah, I've gone back to it a number of times. It's, it's fantastic. But I must just ask if uh, if you were going abroad for for a year to a desert island, uh, give me the three books that you'd take with you. I suppose the question really is, what are your top three books? Which is not easy. I, I think that if um, were to take three books to a desert island, you would you would want uh, books that had a certain amount of variety in them. Mm. Uh, I would certainly take uh, collected works of W.H. Auden, collected po- poetry of W.H. Uh, Auden, uh, because I, I love that so much. Um, and that would keep me, uh, yes. keep me busy and, and satisfied, I think. Uh, then I think uh, one would take a, a very large collection of essays. I rather like the essay as a literary form. And I think I would take uh, maybe uh, Montaigne's um, essays, uh, because there's so much in them, and they, he deals with all sorts of different subjects. He deals with friendship. They're lengthy uh, considerations of, of of friendship. And uh, then the third one uh, could well be um, uh, Homer's Odyssey. Okay. Uh, I think uh, that would uh, that would give one uh, a great deal of of, of pleasure. Uh, that's such an extraordinary work that in, in one of the good translations mm. and the, 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 there's some very fine 
uh, do, do you have a, do you have a favorite well, translation? Fitzgerald translation mm. is, is one that I I like. There's a new one which is uh, highly regarded, but I think that is that is beautifully beautifully done. So I think I might take that because that book uh, really has extraordinary resonance. It's an extraordinary extraordinary feel to it. Uh, it's it's slightly surprising. The story is so familiar; we know what's going to happen. Of course, but it it uh, it would be a very good companion. Yeah, not much light relief there, though. <laughs> no, no light relief. I might I might take Horace's Odes. Uh, I think uh, that might be a good book to have 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 with with one. Great. Or the Book of Common Prayer <clears throat> is another one because of the marvelous. Uh, Cranmerian prose, that wonderful English, mm. the, the beautiful, beautiful language, English language at its absolute finest at that point. And it's all been downhill since then. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think that's probably the, uh, <laughs> the, the perfect, perfect note to end on. Alexander Coulson, if that was your life in books, thank you so much. I do hope this podcast will inspire all of you to do that strangely old fashioned thing and put your phone down for a few minutes each day and pick up a book instead. Thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to address the vexed question of whether men should use facial moisturizer. <laughs> <laughs>